Hello and welcome to my talk on Kubernetes on Raspberry Pi. We're going to look at the past, the present and the future and I'm going to make this quite personal as we go through my journey but also hope there's going to be lots that you can apply here for your own Raspberry Pi cluster. Now we start at the beginning, you know, why would you even do this? That is the question many people ask. Um, where are we today? How did we get there? What are the technologies? What are the changes that have come in? I'm going to give you a bit of materials because everyone always seems to ask for that, but I'm actually going to give you more than one. I'm going to give you four or five and you can pick the one that fits your budget. We're also going to look at what is the future of ARM um, and then go on and I'm going to give you a demo that we've worked really hard on um, with some cool tools as well. Then we'll have a cheat sheet. The cheat sheet will give you common questions and answers like how do you do storage, how do you get a public IP address and so forth. Now this is the one question that you will always get if you pass, post something on Hacker News or Twitter. What is a real world use case? Well at New Mexico there's a consortium of three universities and they built out this BitScope 750 node cluster. Well, perhaps they may not have access to the full expensive cluster um, and supercomputer. Maybe they're having to timeshare it. By having this pretty cost-effective unit at their disposal, they can test their algorithms, have very fast cycles uh, before they can schedule time with bigger, um, much more expensive computers. So HPC is an interesting one. Now at the edge, we see content delivery networks, Cloudflare wrote two years ago how they've been adopting ARM64 for a lot of their workloads. Now, have you ever got a fine or a ticket from parking in the wrong place? Well, machine learning models running at the edge are doing things like reading plates of cars um, and then sending you a letter and a fine a few weeks later. We've also got things like points of sale. Um, there's a, a use case from Chick-fil-A where they run five Intel Nooks in their restaurants and they run Kubernetes on it. You could equally well do that on a, a rack of Raspberry Pis. Now we'll also have a look at some managed cloud services that are using ARM. And I think you know one of the things is we need to get ready for when ARM as a laptop device becomes mainstream and we've got this all day or multi-day battery. We're gonna need binaries at work. Raspberry Pi is a good way of getting on that ramp. But for you, I think, you know, the real reason needs to be because you want to. And we can justify it however we want, but at the end of the day, this needs to be because you want to, and you need to be motivated, because there are some challenges. But um, it is great to practice on real hardware. I just love being able to pull an ethernet cable and be able to deploy to a real server running my house 24 7 not worrying about the bill um, unlike if i leave stuff running on my amazon account now whether that's a website or a github bot it's up to you there's a ton of stuff you can run here my demo rig today is running k3s it's a bitscope cluster blade and unlike most raspberry pis it's actually net booted over the network and it's running off a um an m v m E Express storage inside an Intel NUC. So all of those file systems are actually um, pretty redundant and they're running very fast. As well as that, we've got some redundancy in the control plane and running three master nodes and etc. D or SETI D there as well. And it's got a public IP address. And that's how later on GitHub Actions will be able to deploy a new version of my code um, straight into my house. But I didn't start there actually. My first foray was running a blog at home and it was a ghost blog. And that was in 2013. I was writing about Docker and Node.js and learning about all these kinds of open source tools. But Node.js took about three seconds to run Hello World back then. It was slow on ARM. And I had to build SQLite and it took over 12 hours to get the binary. And some of the times it would crash halfway through. There were some problems though. Uh, my ISP wasn't that great back in the day and my website might have been in Docker Weekly um, and then people are messaging me saying, why is your blog down? That wasn't a good experience. Um, performance 
again I had to introduce an Nginx cache on the device just to get a few more uh, requests per second out of the Node.js application and then finally Ingress you know you can port forward your router but you've now exposed your home address or your location to the world not a smart move um, and I've got a solution for you for that as well. Not long afterwards, um, well, in 2016, I'd been messing about with Docker and containers and clusters and built this seven node Raspberry Pi 2 cluster, just with little metal standoffs between each of them. And I wrote about this in a Linux uh, magazine. It was published, it was available on the high street. And it turned out that people really love this. They love the idea of running their own cluster. Now back then we had Docker Swarm, but things have changed since. We had to build Docker and Swarm itself, and sometimes we even had to build Go from source. And this is something that could take hours, and if you had the wrong kernel option, you had to go back to the start again. So when Docker released their official binaries and packages in in August 2016, I was over the moon, um, and so was um, the Raspberry Pi Foundation when they wrote this post. Now, we wouldn't be where we are without the work of Lucas Kaldstrom, a teenage boy from Finland who, at school, had this idea. He really wanted to run um, Kubernetes components on his Raspberry Pi, similar time as I was running Swarm um, on my cluster. And he did a lot of work, and eventually he found that Kubernetes was so big it wouldn't even compile in Go anymore. Um, and he worked upstream with the Go team to get that fixed. So we do have a debt of gratitude to him and he's still involved in the, in the project quite heavily. And one of the things that I did then was to go and write up um, a tutorial, Kubernetes on Raspbian, because I wasn't comfortable getting a third party operating system. I wasn't comfortable having to build a kernel. I wanted to get the upstream supported Raspberry Pi operating system and lay down Kubernetes. And that's where this came about. Um, it became so popular that there's been dozens and dozens of blog posts where people have done it themselves using that work and even got to present with Scott Hanselman um, at a conference and it was a lot of fun. But eventually KubeADM, which is what we were using there, started to feel sluggish um, it started to fail because the timeouts were designed for cloud computers that were much more powerful. And we had this time where I couldn't really run Kubernetes on my Raspberry Pi anymore. Um, the Raspberry Pi 2 was completely ruled out due to a bug. And then Darren Shepard released K3S. Um, originally, it was a, something like an 8 million line patch to make it small. Today, it is a much less of a patch. In fact, you can install it with curl or with ketchup and you'll have Kubernetes in less than 30 seconds, even on a Raspberry Pi. Now, you couldn't have got anywhere near as fast with kubeadmin before. The resources that it takes are just 500 megs, not your two gigs per server. Um, and then if you're adding a worker, and we're looking at 50 megs of RAM, it is so low. But it's also useful for public cloud. Um, and you can run this on Amazon, you can add the cloud controller, you can get storage volumes, load balancers, you can add all that back in if you want. Um, and then the high availability story here is you can actually use SQL or RDS, so set up Postgres, um, and then that takes over the role of keeping the cluster state. And you can actually scale these to hundreds of thousands of clusters all off one database. Pretty interesting. Now, free is less than eight, and that's where the name comes from. It's the idea of shrinking down, and this is something that really has resonated well with people. I was at Darren Shepard's talk, and people had their, you know, their backs against the wall. It was standing room only. There was so many people interested in this. Um, but it is still full Kubernetes, and it is GA, so you don't have to worry that it's only for your Raspberry Pi. Now, part of the reason that it is actually so quick is because what Darren's done is he said, right, instead of picking a network driver, it's always Flannel. Instead of having SETD running 
we're going to use SQLite, much smaller. And instead of installing Docker and getting the right runtime, we're just going to use ContainerD and skip Docker completely. And that kind of, you could think, well, Kubernetes is about configuring everything possible and isn't that great. You can bring some of those things back in, but actually having somebody said it's okay to have these settings means you can move really fast. On a bonus point, you get volume provisioning, you get an ingress controller, metrics, and Darren's even added a, a way of installing Helm chart. So it's pretty a pretty good package and he's updating it all the time. Now, if you think of this journey and the sort of the last few slides have explained the time that we had Go binaries was probably about the Raspberry Pi 2 timeline. Docker then got support for ARM and Alexandros at Resin did a lot of work for that, um, as did Stefan and Dieter at Hypriot. Um, the, around the time Classic Swarm was popular, I spent a lot of time porting the binaries. Um, I went to DockerCon and gave a talk where I had sensors interacting with the, the cluster and detecting motion. Then we got those Docker packages in 2016, which were great. Moving on from there, Solomon had the grand vision of Docker Swarm, the new version, um, and then Lucas comes into the picture, and then Kubernetes on Raspbian. We have a big gap there, maybe a couple of years, and then K3S arrives, and it just completely changes the conversation about Kubernetes on ARM. We get the 64-bit Raspbian OS, that's still in beta as I speak, but Ubuntu 20 is available as well. Okay, So by default, we're running a 32-bit operating system for compatibility backwards, but this 64-bit is where, where the future is. Now, when it comes to building your own, I want you to think about well, what, you know, what is your budget and what are you willing to spend and what do you want to do with it? If you're looking to use spare parts, it could cost you nothing. You might already have this stuff. Um, this was the way I entered into it. Copper standoffs, Raspberry Pi 3, some SD cards, and you can use a, a multi-charger for powering these. Maybe get a 60 watt. If you want to netboot though, you're gonna need the B3 Plus. I have the older B, I've got 25 of them, and I can't netboot them, and it's annoying. If you're building on a budget, this is where most of you are, I expect. You wanna start here. You only need one Raspberry Pi to run K3S, you don't need 10. And maybe pick a number like four, and you can either buy the two gig model, I'm using that for my demo, I'm using four of them, or you can go up to eight gigs. I mean, um, K3S doesn't need a lot of resources, you just need to think about what you wanna run. But you will need official power supplies, one each. You can't use a multi-charger, I've been there, done that, it doesn't have enough power, uh, it will brown out, and you must add fans, okay? A case like this will, will give you that. As an upgrade though, you can netboot from a, an SSD and a PC, and then this will be so fast. Now, Turing Pi, you may have heard of this, um, they sent me one to play with, it's, it's over here. It's pretty expensive, but what I like about it is there's one cable for power and one cable for ethernet, and that's that. You then program compute modules, and they're like mini Raspberry Pis, but without any ports. Plug them in, boot it up, and you're done. Now, the CM4 is arriving soon. Um, in fact, it's already been released, and there'll be a Turing Pi 2 that will take these, and it's going to be a beast. It's going to have um, SSDs in it. it. It'll be ridiculously expensive, but also very fast. But best in class, and this is what I have, um, is to go and get an edge rack. Something that you can mount in your garage, you can put a UPC on it, you can boot it off the network, uh, UPS rather, you can power it with a proper 12 to 24 volt power. Um, you could even go and install this in a shop somewhere or in offsite, and this could run your workloads, manage it remotely. And this is where industrial Raspberry Pi I think is really gonna take off. So over those last five years of building these clusters and tinkering and writing blog posts, um, I noticed a certain number of problems and it was always the same sort of thing. How do I deploy code? It's 
so confusing to write YAML. Um, I need a network connection. I don't know what software is available for ARM and I spend half my time installing things that don't work. Well, you can go and read this blog post and it shows you all of those things that I created, some stuff that maybe will get you inspired. But to sum up, these are four of the projects that came out of that journey. The first is OpenFAS. And OpenFAS is something that you can deploy and it does work on ARM. It will then allow you to deploy functions and APIs. So if you have a web hook receiver or blog, um, if you want to write a microservice in Java, Python, Go, you name it, it can get you there very quickly. K3S can be installed with curl, but also can be installed with ketchup. And so if you liked Docker Swarm, where it's in it on one node and then join on another one with a token, ketchup brings that back. I'm going to show you the syntax. Inlets allows you to get a public IP address for load balancer. That's something that you just can't get normally. In a cloud, whenever you deploy a service, it normally has a load balancer. The cloud will provision a hardware software load balancer, hook up an IP address for you, serve your traffic. Um, you can't do that at home. You can now if you install inlets and there's an operator that works with Kubernetes. And then the last thing is Arcade. Um, it, it will tell you if a chart is compatible or not. And we have about 30 there. Um, there are things like Istio, which is currently not available for Raspberry Pi, but maybe in the future. Um, things like OpenFAS, um, things like Minio, which are, and that you can just go and install. Now, I want to show you a demo, of putting all of this together. And this is for, a, I'm not going to say it's a blog, it's more like a CMS, because um, there's probably not much point running a blog on a Raspberry Pi, maybe a bit overpowered for that. You can use a CDN. But what if you want to get a better experience? Or what if you want to run a blog of blogs? What if you want to run a SaaS for a thousand customers? Maybe you could think about it like this. We have an admin panel. It's called add post, and that's a function. We write a bit of markdown and tell it what the name is. We then do a git commit and hands are off at that point. Next, a GitHub action in your git repo will run Hugo take the markdown, output HTML, put it in a Docker file, and then deploy it to your cluster as the blog function. And we can have all of that in a loop where we don't have to get involved. All you do is you write your code in a web page, hit commit, it's password protected, and then you get it published on your blog as static content. Well, that's what we're gonna do. So the first thing is I took my Raspberry Pis and I ran ketchup install. I put the IP address and the user. I then went to the next one and I did a join and I gave it the server's IP address. Um, and then I had a cluster and it just took a few minutes. The next thing I did is I used the arcade tool and whilst you can go off to brew, app to get or trawl the internet to get kubectl, um, this is a really easy way of getting it. So I ran kubectl get, arcade get, Sorry, RK get kubectl, get ketchup, get fast CLI, and ran these commands. I then installed OpenFAS, and with each of these apps or charts, you can pass parameters. And then I installed um, an ingress controller and cert manager, right? Because I want some way of getting TLS on there, because I want this to be secure, and mapping that to my domain. Now, OpenFAS is quite simple to get started with but it's also really powerful. If you want to, you can just run fast CLI new and put Python 3, C sharp, Go, PHP, pick a language, the name of your function, so Stripe payment, and then when you run fast CLI up, it will deploy to your instance by building an image, pushing in a registry, and then pulling it into the cluster. And so you can kind of see on this picture the ways to interact are by CLI, UI, and the REST API. We also have metrics built into this. So Prometheus will tell you if you have any 500s, if the API is getting called a lot, like it's a popular blog, um, then it will get scaled up for you. And also, if you have something, I don't know, let's say the publish of the blog took three seconds, we can run that asynchronously in the background 
using NATS. Okay, and this is something that you can install. The total amount of RAM is less than 300 megs and most of that is Prometheus. Um, and Prometheus is a time series database to collect your metrics. This is how things look then for our demo today. At the bottom left, we've got the two functions in the boxes, in the, in the circles. They're attached to our gateway. Our gateway is accessed through an ingress controller and has a certificate from Let's Encrypt. Pretty standard. But that's normally where things end because we don't have any way of getting internet in. Maybe you open a port on your firewall if your ISP allows you. But in my example, I installed this inlets operator. It created a tunnel. The tunnel was created on an EC2 VM. And then when my GitHub action talks to that VM's IP address, or my user comes and tries to get to the blog, it gets tunneled back into my network. Hopefully that makes sense. So let's go and try this demo out. So first of all, this is the blog. And you can see that this is um, running on This is running on the public internet. It's got a TLS certificate and it's showing as valid. If I go into my cluster and I get my services in the cube system namespace, we'll see that um, the, the external IP address is showing here too. And then I have an ingress record for this. And we can see it there, kubecon ketchup.dev. Okay. The last post is this one from the community meeting, and I just took the notes if you attended it. And here is my function where I can basically come in and, and write a post. Now, what I thought is we could just um, take a bit of the ketchup readme file and enter it here. And we're just going to give this a title. And you can see that I've entered some markdown. I mean, this is not a product, it's just an example. And um, what I want to do is show you that now when I hit commit, something's happening in the background. My Raspberry Pi is doing a push to the GitHub repo. And we'll be able to see a new commit just here, 12 seconds ago. We can go into it and we can see what it's put in place and it's generated a header for us. Also generated a file name. But a GitHub action has started to run. And this GitHub action is going to clone the repo. It's then going to use the OpenFAS Hugo template to um, build that HTML. In fact, at this point in time, the image is almost ready to be pushed to the Docker Hub. We're now logging into the OpenFAS gateway over the Inlets tunnel. This is going to be pushed remotely, and then we'll see the new version of the blog appear with that post. Right, let's try it out. So we need to go to the blog function. And there we are, it's that. I mean, that probably was less than a minute in total. There's several things we can optimize along the way. We could make a better markdown editor. You know, the sky is the limit there. If we have a look at the events in the open FAS FN namespace, we'll see that the probe, liveness probe stopped working on the old container. The new one was pulled in. We can actually see the git sha here that was used for the image and the tag. And that's a multi-arch image built on the cloud, deployed on our cluster. I also want to show you um, that we can get we can get the top pods across the cluster and see what resources they're using. So we've got CPU usage. Prometheus is actually one of the busier things that we've got here. Um, the blog is basically almost idle. And then we can look at the memory consumption. And 
there's a bunch of things that come with K3S that are running in the background, but overall, we're not really using a lot of resources. We can also run top node, and we're getting this data because K3S comes with the metric server built in. And then the other one that might be interesting is, um, is to get the nodes. And here we see that three are running as SETID, um, as masters, and one is an agent. If one of these was to disappear, we'd be able to tolerate that failure and carry on. So that's a taste of what you can do with your own cluster. But now when we look towards the future, um, I think Managed Cloud has got a lot to do with this journey. Um, Amazon produced, AWS produced a Graviton chip several years ago. They've now introduced a new chip called Graviton 2, which is ARM compatible. You can see a little picture of it there. And then not only can you get the whole machine as bare metal, but you can get individual slices of it as instances with as little as one core um, or, or two gigs of RAM. You can then go and use this with their managed services like RDS and Elasticash and save money. Um, in fact, there's a user here. This tweet was, I think, was from yesterday. Um, and Valentino can show you a graph here of how much um, that is actually costing him per hit inside his company. Now, if you need real control and you want very big servers, Packet also known as Equinix Metal, have great options here. Um, and their data center link is, you know, in, in the regions of tens of gigabytes. It's really, um, really fast. You're only gonna pay between half a dollar and a dollar per hour for these. So it might work out expensive in the long run, but to try it out, it's pretty cheap. Um, and they've done a lot for the ecosystem. So they've worked with vendors like Ampere, um, and they're going to be bringing this new Ultra Max 128 cores. Imagine this HTOP in the background where you can't see what processes you're running in your terminal because you've got too many cores. And it's a good problem to have. And it wouldn't be right to do a talk on ARM without talking about Apple. Um, we've all heard of Apple Silicon, and we might even have had some product announcements by the time you hear this talk. Apple Silicon is not an ARM chip, at least that's what they're saying. It is ARM64 compatible. It's the same instruction set in the same way that an Intel and AMD chip are largely compatible. Now this has potential to give us multi-day battery in a laptop, imagine that. Um, and why this is Apple Silicon and not an ARM chip is because they've had so much more. I mean, they have a machine learning acceleration, they've got great power management, they've got secure enclaves to store secrets and, and state, and a bunch of other stuff. So keep an eye on this. Now you may have seen this error. Usually it's because you've got a binary built for a PC running on your Raspberry Pi, or vice versa. Each of these Raspberry Pis, unfortunately, runs a different version of ARM, and they're not all compatible or they are in some ways. And the latest is the four, it's 64-bit ARM. And if you're building Go, it's fortunately very easy to cross compile. So in the old days, you might have just built that binary on an ARM64 machine for your ARM users. But you can actually build it on your PC or on a Mac or whatever you want and cross compile. And this is how you put the arguments. Now, the tricky thing is that nobody not everyone will call it ARM64. Some people will call it that. Some will call it ARCH64. Some people call this ARM v7. Some people call it ARM HF. And whilst there are similarities and there are nuances, it would be great if we could standardize and we just haven't got there yet. So beware. Docker, however, has done a huge amount of work in this space and their new BuildX tool means that you can take an existing Docker file, it's a multi-stage build here, specify the build platform and a target platform, and they can be different if you want. And then through some trickery and some emulation, um, up top there, I've built for a PC, Raspberry Pi, 32-bit OS, and a 64-bit OS. And there's not much more you have to do. So quick cheat sheet, 
Cube admins too hungry, it's timing out, um, you want more resources, use K3S. Your SD cards are unreliable, look at the Turing Pi, maybe use an EMMC or Netboot. Um, I have a workshop for that, come and speak to me, um, I can give you access to it. And that's what I've used for my cluster. Um, you don't have a load balancer. Okay, well, if you need a public IP address, use an inlet operator. It's a steep learning curve. I know, I get it, I've been through it as well. Ketchup could help you. Use the install and join command, that's all you need. It's then back to normal Kubernetes. And discovering apps. Um, Use Arcade App Install. It will tell you if it's going to work or not. Um, if there's an app you want to see there, just suggest it on GitHub. Illegal instruction, well, maybe you need to build a new binary. Maybe build it for, with BuildX. Maybe download it manually from the releases page. And there is a story for storage. Lots of people want this. You can use an NFS provisioner that uses your network file system in Linux. You can use local path provisioner that uses the storage on the node from K3S. And soon, the CNCF Rancher uh, project that Rancher donated, Longhorn, should have ARM64 support. It is on their roadmap, and that gives you per persistent volumes in software. Now, just to wrap up, Raspberry Pi and ARM are widely used for real work. I hope that I've got that point across to you. You can build your own private cloud and you do not have to worry about leaving it on like you do with your Amazon account. It is not going to cost you anywhere near what it would cost to run an EKS cluster. But you are going to have to become an advocate if you want to spend some time here. You're going to find yourself um, discovering gaps that other people didn't know about, raising GitHub issues, pull requests, porting software over, um, even going and working with package maintainers and Helm charts. So. It's not for everyone, but you can have a lot of fun while you're at it. And there's a great community around this and a ton of interest. So look out for Apple Silicon. <clears throat> look out for mainstream ARM laptops. And I don't mean one or two, but everybody's using them. I think this is a trend we're going to see. And the CM4 with that super fast PCI slot, we can just stick a, an SSD straight into there. Um, that is going to be ridiculously fast. Keep an eye out for all of these trends, um, and if there's any way that I can be of help, feel free to get in touch. Most importantly, focus on having fun. Remember that um, you do always have the cloud, you always do have Intel machines to fall back on if you're running into trouble. Um, and I do really hope that you have fun with this. So thank you for listening. You can get hold of me on Twitter down below, or you can send me an email. I'll, I'll be glad to hear from you. K3S is available here, my Twitter account. And if you want to join the Open Faz community and talk about those tools or contribute to them, um, you're more than welcome to, welcome to as well. We may have run out of time for Q&A. However, I'll make myself available, whether that's on Slack or, or Twitter, we'll know closer to the time where that is. All right. Thank you so much.